Greetings, and welcome to the Rexford Industrial Realty, Inc. fourth quarter 2019 earnings call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. A question and answer session will follow the formal presentation. If anyone should require operator assistance during the conference, please press star zero on your telephone keypad. As a reminder, this conference is being recorded. I would now like to turn the conference over to your host, Mr. Steve Sweat with ICR. Please go ahead, sir. We thank you for joining us for Rexford Industrial's fourth quarter 2019 earnings conference call. In addition to the press release distributed yesterday after market close, we posted a supplemental package in the investor relations section on our website at www.rexfordindustrial.com. Today's call, management, uh, management's remarks and answers to your questions contain forward-looking statements as defined in the Private Securities Litigation Reform Act of 1995. Forward-looking statements address matters that are subject to risks and uncertainties that may cause actual results to differ from those discussed today. For more information about these risk factors, we encourage you to review our 10-K and other SEC filings. Rexford Industrial assumes no obligation to update any forward-looking statements in the future. In addition, certain financial information presented on this call represents non-GAAP financial measures. Our earnings release and supplemental package present GAAP reconciliation and an explanation of why such non-GAAP financial measures are useful to investors. Today's conference call is hosted by Rexford Industrial's Co-Chief Executive Officers Michael Frankel and Howard Schwimmer, together with Chief Financial Officer Adil Khan. They will make some prepared remarks, and then we will open the call for your questions. Now I'll turn the call over to Michael. Thank you, and welcome to Rexford Industrial's fourth quarter 2019 earnings call. I'll begin with a summary of our operating results and some perspective on our market opportunity. Howard will then cover our acquisition activity and a deal will follow with more details on our financial results and guidance. We will then open the call for your questions. We are very pleased with the fourth quarter and full year 2019 results. Our team continues to execute on our strategy to create value by investing within the infill Southern California industrial market. For the quarter, we achieved company share of core FFO of $35.8 million, which is a 31.4% increase over the prior year quarter. Core FFO per share was $0.32, cents, which represents a 10.3% increase year over year. On a same property basis, NOI increased 5.5% on a gap basis and 7.2% on a cash basis. And after excluding the impact from the lease-up of properties and repositioning, stabilized same property gap NOI increased by 4.1% and cash NOI increased by 5.1%. During the quarter, we signed 115 leases for approximately 1.5 million square feet. Our comparable leasing spreads were 42% on a gap basis and 27.1% on a cash basis. We achieved 97.6% occupancy in our stabilized same property portfolio at year end. We also completed 10 acquisitions during the quarter for an aggregate purchase price of approximately $258 million and completed $20.8 million of disposition. And for the full year, we grew company share of core FFO by 34.3% and by 9.8% on a per share basis. Same property NOI increased 6.2% on a gap basis and 8.7% on a cash basis. Excluding the impact from the lease up of properties and repositioning, stabilized same property gap NOI increased by 3.7% and cash NOI increased by 6.1%. We signed over 400 leases, totaling 5.3 million square feet, and we completed 34 acquisitions for a total of $970 million of investment in our target infill Southern California industrial market, representing a 24.7% increase in portfolio square footage. Approximately 79% of 2019 acquisitions were achieved through off-market or lightly marketed transactions sourced through our proprietary originations methods with 41% of investments providing value-add renovation and repositioning opportunities to increase cash flow and value over time. 2019 was also notable for the release of our inaugural Environmental, Social, and Governance Report, which detailed numerous positive ESG impacts achieved through the execution of our unique business model. We quantified the substantial environmental benefits associated with our value-add repositioning and recycling of industrial buildings the higher value industrial use. The year was also notable as our team drove the dramatic growth of Rexford's unique portfolio within the nation's largest and strongest industrial market while maintaining a low leverage, 
fortress-like balance sheet, which ended the year at 3.7 times net debt to adjusted EBITDA. As a result of these exceptional results, we are pleased to announce that we are increasing our quarterly dividend by 16.2% to 21.5 cents per share. This is our fifth consecutive year with a dividend increase, and we have now raised the quarterly dividend by 79% since our IPO in 2013. With regard to market conditions, we continue to experience a substantial supply-demand imbalance. Despite extremely limited supply, incremental tenant demand continues to be driven by a few key factors, including a strong economy with Southern California positioned as the nation's largest and most diverse zone of consumption. We also benefit from sustained e-commerce growth and the continued demand for shorter delivery timeframes. Our portfolio is 100% positioned within prime last-mile infill Southern California industrial markets, located within and adjacent to the nation's largest regional population. Our infill locations are critical to enable tenants to satisfy the increasing demand for short delivery timeframes. Meanwhile, on the supply side, although certain other large U.S. industrial markets are experiencing an increase in supply, Infill Southern California continues to experience diminishing supply due to a lack of developable land, permanent barriers limiting new construction, and as product continues to be removed from the market through conversion to non-industrial, higher-value uses. As a result of these factors, our portfolio is operating at essentially full occupancy, and we believe we are positioned to generate favorable NOI growth into future periods. Our in-place portfolio, for example, assuming no additional acquisition, is positioned over the next 18 to 24 months to potentially generate about 17% incremental annualized NOI growth compared to Q4 2019, equal to almost $40 million, driven by the following go-forward contributions to NOI. About $14.6 million from the completion and lease-up of properties in repositioning, Approximately $12.6 million through the mark-to-market of 9.3 million square feet of expiring leases, with rental rates estimated to be about 15% below market. About $6 million from the impact of properties acquired in the fourth quarter, plus about $5 million generated by 2.4 million square feet of executed but uncommenced leases. In addition, as our investment pipeline continues to grow in volume and quality, we expect to continue to acquire accretive investments within high-demand infill Southern California industrial markets, which we believe will drive additional NOI growth. In closing, we couldn't be more excited about our go-forward opportunity. Our team continues to execute at an outstanding level, and we are grateful to our team members, each of whom makes an exceptional contribution towards our collective success. In particular, we'd like to acknowledge and thank our Chief Financial Officer, Adil Khan, for his exemplary service at Rexford over the prior eight years. As we announced last month, we are excited and support Adil as he seeks a new chapter in his career as he ultimately transitions out of the CFO role. Adil plans to stay on board serving as our CFO until a new CFO is transitioned into the role, and thereafter, we hope to establish a new go-forward role for Adil at Rexford, consistent with his personal and professional objectives. And with that, I'm very pleased to turn the call over to Alex. Thanks, Michael, and thank you, everyone, for joining us today. The infill Southern California industrial market continues to outperform, with the supply-demand imbalance maintaining the strong landlord market that allows us to continue driving rents and maintain high occupancy levels. Our target markets, which exclude the Eastern Inland Empire, ended the fourth quarter at 2% vacancy, with asking rents up 8.7% on a weighted average basis over the past 12 months, according to CBRE. Turning to acquisitions, the full year 2019 was stellar for our growth. We completed 34 acquisitions for a total of $970 million, which added 5.4 million rentable square feet to our portfolio. During the fourth quarter, we completed 10 acquisitions, totaling approximately $258 million and adding 1.8 million square feet to the portfolio. 80% of these transactions were off-market or lightly marketed, with 50% of the transactions value-add. Our ability to source off-market investment opportunities derives from our unique sourcing methodologies and deep market relationships, which result in significant benefits to Rexford in terms of superior returns. 
our projected stabilized yields remain very attractive and accretive, ranging from 5.3% to 7.3% in the quarter. In October, we acquired Slauson Commerce Center, a 336,000-square-foot industrial complex located within the L.A. Central submarket for $41 million. The two-building property is in an extremely supply, supply-constrained supply submarket, fully leased at rents that are estimated to be approximately 17% below market. Our initial yield is about 5% and growing thereafter. As a note, the yields I reference here and for subsequent transactions are presented on an unleveraged basis. We acquired West Manville Street, a 60,000-square-foot, 22-foot clear industrial building in the L.A. South Bay submarket, for $11.5 million. The property is fully leased on a long-term basis at an initial yield of 5.3%. Also in October, we acquired Crestmore Point, a 56,000-square-foot building in the central San Diego submarket for $8 million. The two-tenant, low-coverage property has the opportunity to increase approximately 24% below market rents by renewing in-place tenants or repositioning the property. The initial yield is 4.8%, with a projected stabilized yield on total cost of 7.3%. In November, we acquired Berry Way, a 120,000-square-foot, three-building industrial property with excess land, located in the Orange County North submarket for $27.6 million, which equates to a below-market land value of $58 per square foot. The fully leased property offers future value-add opportunity and our initial yield is 5.6%. Also in November, Rexford acquired Motor Avenue, a 4.2-acre land site located in the L.A. San Gabriel Valley submarket for $7.2 million. We intend to construct a 97,000-square-foot, 32-foot-clear Class A industrial building on this infill land parcel. At completion, our yield on total cost is estimated to be 5.7%. We also acquired... East E Street, located in the L.A. South Bay submarket for $14.9 million. The port-adjacent 58,000-square-foot modern property is fully occupied by three tenants at approximately 38% below market rent and includes excess paved land for container storage. Our initial yield is 3.1%, and the estimated stabilized yield on total cost is 5.3%. Rexford also acquired Monarch Street, a five-tenant, two-building complex located in the Orange County West submarket for $34 million. The project contains approximately 277,000 square feet, and at least expiration, we intend to redevelop one of the buildings with a state-of-the-art 97,000-square-foot Class A industrial building and also improve functionality and aesthetics for the remaining building. Our initial yield is 4.6%, and the projected stabilized yield on total cost is estimated to be 5.3%. In December, we acquired Pomona Distribution Center, a two-tenant industrial building located in the L.A. San Gabriel Valley submarket for $88 million. The property contains approximately 752,000 square feet with an in-place rents estimated to be about 20% below market. At lease expiration, we expect to drive cash flow by retenanting at higher rates or by executing value-add repositioning generating a projected stabilized yield on total cost of about 5.6%. Also in December, we acquired Del Amo Boulevard, a single-tenant industrial building located in the L.A. South Bay submarket for $12 million. The 57,000-square-foot building is fully leased at approximately 50% below market rent and contains excess land for container storage. Upon lease expiration, we expect to perform minor repositioning to drive rents to market. The initial yield is 3.6%, and the projected stabilized yield on total cost is 5.8%. Finally, Rexford acquired Euclid Street, a single-tenant industrial building located in the Orange County West submarket for $14 million. The 63,000-square-foot property was acquired in a long-term sale leaseback transaction at an initial yield of 5.3%. Turning to dispositions, during the fourth quarter, we sold two multi-tenant properties, for an aggregate of $20.8 million. This brings our 2019 disposition total to $33.6 million, and we expect to continue to sell assets on a opportunistic basis to unlock value and recycle capital. Now I'd like to take a moment to update you on our value-add repositioning program. 
During the fourth quarter, we completed repositioning of a 110,000-square-foot building in our Mission Oaks project in Ventura. The fully stabilized 462,000-square-foot project has achieved a 9% return on cost, exceeding our initial underwriting by 160 basis points. For the full year 2019, we stabilized about 875,000 square feet of repositioning at an average stabilized yield of 8.1%. Moving forward, we have a deep pipeline for value creation with approximately 1 million square feet currently under repositioning or about to start construction, and another approximately 400,000 square feet to start later in 2020 and 2021. Finally, Though 2019 was certainly a record year in terms of acquisition volume, our pipeline remains strong as we look ahead in 2020. We currently have $268 million of new investments under LOI or contract, which includes a $210 million portfolio recently announced. These acquisitions are subject to completion of due diligence thank and acknowledge for his outstanding contributions to Rexford's success over the past years. Adil? Thank you, Howard, and thank you, Michael and Howard, for your kind words, beginning with our operating results. For the fourth quarter 2019, net income attributable to common stockholders was approximately $19.9 million, or $0.18 cents per fully diluted share. This compares to $12.4 million, or $0.13 cents per fully diluted share for the fourth quarter of 2018. For the three months ended December 31, 2019, company share of core FFO was $35.8 million as compared to $27.2 million for the three months ended December 31, 2018. On a per share basis, company share of core FFO was $0.32 cents per fully diluted share, representing a 10.3% increase year over year. For the full year 2019, Rexford reported net income attributable to common stockholders of approximately $50.5 million of $0.47 cents per fully diluted share as compared to net income attributable to common stockholders of $36.1 million of $0.41 cents per fully diluted share for 2018. For the full year 2019, Rexford reported company share of core FFO for $131.1 million compared to $97.6 million for the year ended December 31, 2018. On a per share basis, company share of core FFO was $1.23 per fully diluted share for 2019, a 9.8% increase compared to $1.12 for fully diluted share reported in 2018. Same property NOI was $39.3 million in the fourth quarter, which compares to $37.3 million for the same quarter in 2018, an increase of 5.5%. Our same property NOI was driven by a 6.7% increase in total rental revenue and a 10.5% increase in property operating expenses. Increase in property operating expenses was due to a favorable property tax adjustment in fourth quarter 2018, combined with an unfavorable property tax adjustment in fourth quarter 2019. Including the combined effects of these adjustments, property expenses increased by 4.1%. On a cash basis, same property NOI increased by 7.2% year over year. Stabilized same property NOI growth, net of the impact of repositioning was 4.1% in the fourth quarter on a gap basis and 5.1% on a cash basis. For the full year 2019, same property NOI increased 6.2%, driven by a 5.7% increase in revenue and a 3.9% increase in property operating expense. On a cash basis, same property NOI increased by 8.7% compared to 2018. Net of the the contribution from properties in repositioning, 2019 stabilized same property NOI increased 3.7% on a gap basis and 6.1% on a cash basis. Turning now to our balance sheet. On stock, for ATM at a rated average price of $46.77 per share, which resulted in net proceeds to Rexford of approximately $137 million. We utilize this fund to fund our acquisitions for working capital and other corporate purposes. At the end of the fourth quarter, we had $78.9 million of cash full availability on our $350 million credit facility, and approximately $344 million available on our ATM program. We have no debt maturities to 2021, with our next maturity being our $100 million term loan in 2022. Finally, our net debt to adjusted EBITDA ratio at year end was approximately 3.7 times, 
which equates to about 12.3% debt to total enterprise value. With regard to our dividend, on February 10, our board of directors declared a cash dividend of 21.5 cents per share for the first quarter of 2020, payable on April 15 to common stock and unit holders of record as of March 31. Additionally, our board of directors declared a Series A and B preferred stock cash dividend for approximately 37 cents per share for the first quarter of 2020, payable on March 31 to our Series A and B preferred stock holders as of March 13. Also, our board of directors declared a Series B preferred stock cash dividend for approximately 35 cents per share for the first quarter of 2020, payable on March 31 to our Series B preferred stockholders as of March 13. Finally, I'd like to introduce our outlook for 2020. We expect to achieve company share of core after within a range of $1.30 to $1.32 per share. Our guidance is supported by several factors. We expect year-end stabilized same property occupancy within a range of 96% to 97%. We expect to achieve stabilized same property NI growth for the year of 3.7% to 4.2%. Please note that our 2020 stabilized same property pool comprises 160 properties with an aggregate of 19.8 million square feet, representing approximately 75% of our consolidated portfolio square footage. This portfolio was 97.9% occupied at January 1, 2020. For GNA, we anticipate a full year range from $36.5 to $37 million, including about $14 million of non-cash equity compensation. Please remember that our guidance refers to our in-place portfolio as of today and the pending acquisition of the 11 property portfolio previously disclosed in the Form 8K filed on December 23, 2019. Our guidance does not include any assumptions for acquisition, disposition, or capital transactions which have not yet been announced. Also, our guidance for co-op before does not include acquisition costs or the costs that we typically exclude when calculating this metric. And finally, as a note for 2020, we're only providing guidance for stabilized stands or NOI as we believe this is the best measure to convey the performance of our operating portfolio. That completes our prepared remarks. With that, we'll open the line to take any questions. Operator? Thank you. At this time, we'll be conducting a question and answer session. If you would like to ask a question, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad. A confirmation tone will indicate your line is in the question queue. You may press star 2 if you would like to remove your question from the queue. For participants using speaker equipment, it may be necessary to pick up your handset before pressing the star key. One moment, please, while we poll for questions. Your first question comes from the line of Jamie Feldman with Bank of America, Maryland. Please proceed with your question. Great. Thank you. Um, I guess just to start out, can you talk about your outlook uh, for cash same strand OI next year? I know you provide GAP. Uh, yeah, hi, Jamie. So the outlook uh, for cash, uh, um, just for the uh, for everybody, 3.7, 4.2 was the gap numbers. Cash would be 5.2% to 5.7, so 1.5% higher. Okay. And then can you talk about your assumption for interest expense uh, for next year, what's baked into the model, and just how we should think about any kind of pieces of debt that might be either – I know you said – uh, you have no expirations over the next couple of years, but any other kind of unique financing we should be thinking about? Uh, right, Jamie, the deal here again. So for uh, for debt, uh, just make, uh, making certain that we are factoring in the model, the, the debt that we placed last year, you're going to see the full year impact of that, but that was fixed at $75 million, $25 million, which was uh, done in Q3 last year. So that needs to be in the model for everybody. And the other piece that is uh, part of our guidance is relating to the 11 property portfolio which is going to have some assumed debt, uh, and that AK was issued in December 23. So that's also factored into our uh, interest expense for next year, which is also going into the ethical guidance that we issued. Okay. And then, sorry to keep nitpicking on some of these details, but like leasing spreads, what do you guys think that looks like next year? Uh, hi, Jamie. Howard. We don't, we don't see really any changes in the market uh, you know, today in, in 2020. Things are fast pace, we're signing a lot of a lot of transactions and from what I what I've seen, you know, through the beginning of the year, we're we're pretty similar to where we've been in the past. Maybe not as high as the past quarter we've we've just reported on in terms of those spreads. Uh but you know, very impressive spreads. And Jamie
Jamie. It's Michael. Good to hear your voice. Uh, you know, I think we've indicated that the mark to market on expiring leases uh, is about 15%. Okay. And then just last for me, you know, some of your peers have talked about just how business feels today versus this time last year. How would you answer that question? Uh, it's a great question, and uh, business feels equally strong as it did a year ago. Uh, we're not seeing any signs of change uh, in terms of tenant demand. Okay. All right. Thank you. Your next question comes from the line of Blaine Heck with Wells Fargo. Please proceed with your question. Great. Thanks. Good morning out there. Um, so clearly the coronavirus has been dominating headlines and, and has been a popular topic of discussion amongst retailers and, and some logistics companies. Can you just talk about whether you guys have seen any disruption in leasing or, or even discussions with tenants that might be worried about the impact to their supply chain? Hi, Blaine. It's Howard. Um, that's, you know, that's a great question. And, you know, we, we really, we pulled all of our leasing people, the property management staff. And I think really the best barometer that you know, we're seeing is a couple of our projects. One is a few of the uh, small bay dock high projects in uh, the Inland Empire, as well as the San Gabriel Valley. And there's, you know, one was a 1.1 million square foot project. And we have two others that Really, they add up to about a million and a half feet. They're occupied in the high 90% range. And our leasing people, surprisingly, actually, were, were telling us that there's been a resurgence of leasing activity, uh, you know, in, in, in the beginning of the year. So, you know, surprisingly, we're doing quite well, and they're not seeing any signs of a slowdown in those particular uh, projects, which are, I, I would think, probably 80% or more occupied by Asian businesses. We also talked to uh, a few of the different tenants we have that uh, are expiring right now that were already in lease renewal negotiations that are 3PL. And interestingly, they're all telling us that they're diversifying, or rather their customers are actually diversifying where their goods are coming in from so they're not as reliant on China. And some of these guys are actually talking to us now about even taking more space. So. Again, not not really seeing any impact or or slowdown in demand or, or growth from the repeal. And, and Blaine, it's Michael. I'll add to that too as a reminder that our tenant base in infill Southern California in our portfolio is disproportionately you know, demand is disproportionately driven by local regional consumption. And uh, you know about fifty percent of all imports are, are distributed and consumed regionally, uh, plus or minus. And you know we've we've seen other periods where. In historical periods where we've seen a slowdown or even a shutdown of the port, which would be a good proxy for a slowdown of imports driven by anything. For instance, in 2002, we had an actual shutdown of the port due to labor. Um, and what we saw during those periods was literally you know, no change at all in, in tenant demand within our portfolio. And again, it's principally because it's demand-driven, consumption-driven, and as Howard stated, you know, the tenants uh, get creative. They need to in terms of where they find the goods or how they source the goods. But uh, demand has not shown any signs of letting up. Great. That's helpful. Uh, then great job on the renewal lease uh, that you guys signed with Cosmetic Labs during the quarter. I think the other large expiration you guys have this year is 280 or so thousand square feet with command logistics. Can you just uh, speak to the probability of, of renewal there or any discussions you guys are having with that tenant? Sure. Uh, this is Howard again. Blaine. So, you know, if you looked at our top 20 expiring leases, that's about one and three-quarter million square feet. That represents about 45% of all of 2020 expirations. And today, we're actually in discussions for renewals with about 70% of those top 20 tenants. And that certainly also includes command, which at this point we feel there's a high probability on, on, on their renewal as well. Great. Uh, last one for me. Uh, it was reported, I think, that you guys bought a property from Prologis this quarter, uh, 41 million. I think it was this loss in Com Commerce Center. Um, can you just talk about any differences you guys may have seen in negotiating with a large kind of publicly traded REIT versus maybe some of the off-market deals you guys do with uh, lo more local players? Uh, well, I'd, I'd say it's you know it's always a pleasure to work with a professional. And most of the time when we deal with institutional sellers or you know, large REITs, such as a prologist, the transactions go very smooth because we all know what we're doing. Do 
you guys expect a lot more opportunity could come from PLB since they're trimming down a couple of the large portfolios they purchased recently, or is this more of a one-off? Uh, well, we bought actually two product properties from them. The other was the uh, just 700,000 change distribution building in Pomona. That was also purchased uh, from them as well. And we, we have ongoing discussions, and we, you know, we'd love the opportunity to buy more. Uh, but obviously, we can't predict or tell you anything about what's happening today. All right. Fair enough. Thanks, guys. Your next question comes from the line of Manny Korchman with City. Please proceed with your question. Hey, everyone. Um, a deal, if we look at your occupancy guidance for the year, it shows a, a significant dip at year end 20 versus January 1st of, of 20. Can you talk about sort of the, the maybe the uh, trend of occupancy throughout the year and what's causing that year end staff to, to drop as much as it is? Hey, Manny, thanks for the question. And yeah, so just to, as a reminder, that's a year end guidance on the occupancy, and that's a spot number at the, as of 4 31. Uh, 2020. So it's not indicative of what the average occupancy might look like for the full year, and that is going to be higher. The second piece that's important to note is that the occupancy that we guide, uh, specifically the 97% on the high end uh, at the end of the year, or on the low end, that it's not directly correlated to the NOI. So you are uh, benefiting from the average occupancy that's within the portfolio during the year. So there is not a direct correlation between those two. But that's not, uh, you know, different from what we've experienced in the past. You know, those are just timing differences and nothing more than that. You know, 1, 121, those things could be rectified pretty quickly. And it's based on the releasing spreads that you have seen over the last, you know, 12 plus quarters. So I think that gives us a lot of uh, opportunity and ability to take those leases that are not being renewed and being pushing, able to push higher rent. So I think that it's an opportunity. It's nothing more than timing from that perspective, but the, the correlation to the NOI is not one to one. And Manny, this is Michael. Thanks for joining us today. Um, and I'd like to give a little insight in terms of how we think about expiration and occupancy uh, on a go forward basis relative to cash flow growth and the opportunity to drive NAV growth. And so if you, if you were sitting here at Rexford Management, if you were in our shoes and you looked at those expiring leases through the end of the year and next year, for example, uh, you know, we have a lot of optionality associated with those choices. And, um, you know, quite, you know, it's not infrequent that we choose to not renew a tenant who would otherwise wish to stay in the space because we see an opportunity to drive additional cash flow and NAV growth. And I'll give a couple examples. Um, let's just say we have a, a space, take a typical property, 100,000 square feet, let's assume uh, $10 uh, per square foot rent per year. And let's say we've owned that property for a while. And as we've stated, we have about a 15% mark to market on expiring leases into the next year and two years. If all we did was roll that tenant and maybe we suffer a dip in occupancy for a short period of time to a higher tenant paying about 15% more rent, well, there, there alone we've driven NAV by 15%. Now let's take another example that gets even more interesting. Let's look at our acquisitions last year. And of the 34 acquisitions we made last year, 28 of them had in-place, inbound cash flow at about a 5% uh, cap rate. And even though they may not have been fully um, leased, and even though there may have been some value creation opportunities with low embedded rent, on average, those same 28 properties have a projected stabilized cap rate uh, that's projected about 6%. So now take that same property example, 100,000 square foot property, $10 rent today when we bought it, bought at a 5% cap rate, that means we paid $20 million for the asset. Let's assume that we solve for a 6% stabilized uh, cap rate. That drives uh, rent to a million two from a million. That's a 20% increase in rent, much of which would fall straight to the FFO bottom line. And, and let's remember that market cap rates are substantially lower than what we're typically buying at. So let's assume a market cap rate around 4%, although we know that market cap rates are oftentimes below 4%. If you take that math together, the asset would then be worth $30 million, which would result in a 50% increase in NAV. Now I'm just going to take one more example, and then I'll finish up here. But let's assume that uh, another option for some expiring space is that we can reposition it, and we do that a lot. Let's assume that same asset, 100,000 square feet, started with $10 rent, bought at a five cap, 
let's assume that we invest another 15% of the purchase price. So we invest uh, uh, another $3 million. So total cost becomes $23 million. But if you'll notice, as we've disclosed last year, all of our repositioning uh, work we saw to about an 8.1% unlevered stabilized yield on completions last year. It's not to say we're going to do that every year, but it's indicative of what our capacity is. So you take that map together, and the um, the total um, uh, value creation there uh, would be about 46. Uh, resulting NAV would be about 46 and a half million dollars. And so that's about that's over a hundred percent increase in NAV on total cost of 23 million dollars. So we've increased NAV by two times. And frankly, you know, we do a lot of deals where we're increasing NAV by substantially uh, greater amounts. So I think it's re- really important to, to internalize and understand the Rexford business model, that uh, occupancy is not the primary measure of, you know, how we're creating value here at the company. And that's one of the beautiful things about Rexford that truly differentiates us from any other peer in the industrial sector and from any other REIT uh, in, the, in the REIT universe, and that we have a fragmented universe of tenants and spaces within our portfolio and within our pipeline of acquisitions, where we have continuous opportunities to create a tremendous amount of value. So oftentimes you'll see us trade occupancy for value creation. Um, thanks, Michael. Um, just switching topics, uh, the top 13 split roles has been a, a big topic of conversation recently. Can you give us your updated uh, thoughts and impact in your portfolio um, and whether it's changed anything in the transaction market to date with, with sellers trying to get ahead of it? Hey, Manny, it's the deal. Uh, thanks for the question. So if the, the profit passed in November 2020, it would be effective in 2022. And we ran a bottoms-up analysis and uh, based on our current leases and what the tax compression looks like in terms of assessed value and so on and so forth, the impact would be less than a penny of FFO if we were to do this today. So it's not very uh, material in terms of the, the FFO impact. The other thing that's important to note is, which we've always educated everybody, is about 48% of our portfolio has been acquired over the last three years. So certainly we're benefiting from that, and I think uh, that allows us to do things that are different. Uh, the other thing is that about 90% of our leases allow us to pass uh, the, the, the increases back, so that's why the impact is very mitigated when I spoke about the FFO impact. So it's a pretty great spot for us to be, and uh, you know I'm sure Howard and Michael can add a little bit more color in just the opportunity set what it does in terms of us playing in a leveling playing field in terms of the other landlords who are going to see this increase. As a reminder, if you'd like to ask a question, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad. As a reminder, if you'd like to ask a question, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad. One moment, please, while we poll for more questions. Your next question comes from the line of Eric Frankel with Green Street Advisors. Please proceed with your question. Uh, thank you. Um, I just wanted to uh, discuss, you know, the capital markets environment. Obviously, read share prices have come up quite a bit since the start of the year. Um, has that changed the mindset of either you or your competitors in terms of just the investment landscape and, and what, the, what buyers are willing to bid uh, in terms of prospective returns on acquisitions? Hey, Eric. It's uh, Michael. Thanks for joining us today. You know, we obviously we can't speak for, for competitors out there, but we see an intense activity on marketed transactions, a lot of capital trying to get into Southern California Industrial because it's the strongest market in the country. And um, But that's it's been that way pretty much forever. Is it more intense today than it was a year ago? You know, it's equally intense. Um, I, I would describe it that way. And with regard to our uh, how we look at the world, I think that was the first part of your question. Um, you know, we don't really think about our fertile rates or weighted average cost of capital in terms of the spot cost of debt or equity, because that can change on a daily or almost hourly basis, particularly with the stock price. And we think about our weighted average cost of capital and the fertile rates more in terms of steady state cost of capital and, and, and um, on the equity and debt side. And so our fertile rates are probably a little higher than, than a lot of our competitors internally. And uh, that's why you see us actually, you know, working so hard. To, to identify off-market and lightly marketed transactions, which comprised, I think, about almost 80% of our transactions last year. But what's amazing with that intensity of activity is that we turned down about 90% of the deals 
that we actually sent LOIs out on last year. We sent out LOIs on about $10.5 billion worth of uh, transactions last year. And frankly, had we been willing to pay just a little more on a lot of those deals, you know, uh, we would have, we would have, we had the potential to deliver substantially higher transaction volume last year. But, you know, we're staying true to our knitting, staying focused, going to keep the discipline. And, uh, you know, hopefully that gives you a little insight into how we see our hurdle rates and, and, uh, and, and, and investment activity given in light of today's capital markets. Uh, that's very helpful, Cower. Thank you. Um, a deal just to follow up, um, on, on the Prop 13 split roll. Uh, could you maybe just clarify how much your reimbursed taxes would increase, um, if the proposition came through and you were, and you were, you know, had higher assessed values in 2022? Yes, absolutely. Uh, so right now, again, obviously we're looking at this analysis as of today. Right now, the gross dollar amount would be about nine million, uh, approximately, in terms of increased assessed uh, uh, dollars in terms of taxes. Uh, keep in mind that you know it's a one percent, maybe slightly higher increase just on a assessed value, and the rest is direct assessments which are not impacted. So it's about nine million dollars of which uh, we're recovering most of it, and that's how we grow up to that. Uh, a little less than a penny in terms of the net of impact after recovery. Okay, thank you. Your next question comes from the line of John with Jeffries. Please proceed with your question. Oh, great. Thank you. Um, in the AK you put out on the 11 property portfolio, which I, I know you guys said is in your guidance, you indicated that you might finance that through OP units. Curious if there's any update there on how you uh, how you plan to, to do if if you could still continue to do that and if how that is worked into the guidance. Hey John, it's Michael here. Thanks for joining us today. You know we we're just not able to update at this time, but once the transaction closed, you'll get all the information. I, I apologize we're not able to give any more. Okay, so, I mean, but I guess how how is it factored into the guidance then? You know what. We really can't comment because can't we haven't closed okay. the transaction, and, and frankly, we don't have that information yet. So, yeah. Uh, we'll, but as soon as we know, you'll know. Okay, and I mean, maybe if you could just speak more broadly in in terms of conversations you're having with uh, with potential sellers, um, and the attractiveness of using your OP units as currency. Um, are you seeing more or, or less of that today? Hi, John. It's Howard. Um, yeah, we've we've seen those conversations growing in frequency. Um, I think that, you know, from where we are as a company, we're a much more stable and attractive business for people to consider trading their assets into. And, and frankly, I think at this point in the cycle, people appreciate the focus, uh, being in Southern California, the strength of the market here. And most of the people we talk to obviously have, we're talking about their assets in Southern California where they have great familiarity with the market. And it's a lot easier to understand what they'd be getting by trading into a company like Rexford versus potentially uh, another business that perhaps owns assets around the country, around the world. Uh, you know, these people are used to being able to understand and make decisions locally. So those conversations are getting more fruitful, and we're hopeful that into the future that we'll be able to transact more frequently on uh, an OP unit type basis. Okay. All right. Thanks for the color. Thank you. Your next question comes from line of Michael Mueller with J.P. Morgan. Please proceed with your question. Hi, good morning. This is Sarah on the floor of Mike Mueller. Um, this question on cash threat, given that there's been a 20% um, range, does your DC that being indicative of the overall portfolio not to market today? I'm sorry. Um, could you repeat the question? You were breaking up a little bit there. Yeah, given that cash spreads have been in the mid-20s, um, and is 2019, do you see that as being representative of the overall portfolio mark to market today? Uh, did you ask cash rent growth is projected mark to market 20% in 2019? Was that the question? Yeah, if that is representative of the overall portfolio mark to market, given that this has been in the mid-20s in 2019. Uh, so, we, you know, I think we've, what we've indicated is on, on the expiring leases, uh, there's about a 15% mark to market. And then, of course, on the in-place leases, typically we have about a 3% rental rate bump embedded in those contractually. So that's sort of the color that we can provide at this point in time. Okay, thank you.
Your next question comes from Chris Lucas with Capital One Security. Please proceed with your question. Hey, guys. Um, just a, a question on the GNA guidance for uh, uh, 2020. Looks like about half of the bump in uh, gross dollar increase uh, uh, in guidance from 20 to over 19 is related to non-cash comp. The rest of it, um, is there headcount increases associated with that or infrastructure investments, or how, how should we be thinking about um, what you're doing with this sort of three-plus million um, increase in g on the cash side? Yeah, no, we appreciate it. Thanks for joining us today. Um, so, you know, there is some headcount increase, um, you know, but not so much on the facility side marginally, but more on headcount. And I think also, if you look at the GNA increase, you, you brought up a great point, which is the bulk of it is non-cash equity, and and the bulk of that, frankly, is performance based. And so, you know, at the end of the day, if we're not performing at exceeding high levels over the longer term, then we won't actually uh, receive that. Unfortunately, we have to account for it though today. Um, and I think also, if you look at the GNA growth relative to the growth of the company. Whether you measure it by uh, FFO growth, whether you measure, measure it by portfolio growth uh, in terms of square footage, but sometimes thrives headcount growth, you'll find that the GNA growth has been substantially lower uh, than the actual growth of the company. So, um, you know, we think we do have a good, good, good amount of operating leverage embedded in the company, and so maybe we're doing a little catch up this year on the organization. those margins continue to grow, operating margins continue to grow as well. And Chris, this is the deal. Just to add, just on the headcount piece, obviously uh, about a year ago when the leasing uh, costs are not part of the DNA, as our portfolio continues to grow, that's some of the headcount that you're also experiencing. So that's part of your DNA. And our portfolio square footage is increasing very meaningfully, and that takes a certain uh, caliber of people and just the overall headcount. So that's also something you're experiencing. I just wanted to add that color in terms of the headcount. Okay, thanks. And, and just um, one more follow-up on that, which is just simply, as it relates to the CFO transition, is there embedded costs that are associated with that process in, in in the guidance, or is that a sort of an extra deal? Um, yeah, Chris, a, a deal again. So we took a conservative approach, and you, we essentially kept my comp uh, in, in its entirety, cash and stock, in, in, in its entirety for the full 2020 year. So I think that was the most conservative uh, way to do it. And obviously, once the transition it's complete. We will have further announcements, and we can further revise guidance if necessary. But right now, it's just the most conservative approach. And, and, and then, Michael or Howard, Michael it, it, Howard, could you comment in terms of where you are in that search process? Yeah, um, we can comment a little bit, but of course, you know, we'll disclose when we actually have um, more concrete knowledge. But I would say that the uh, interest in the role at Rexford has been uh, very, very strong. Um, you know, the the one of the uh, Side benefits of sending out the AK some weeks ago was it kind of put everybody in the finance world that, that operates or is interested in operating in a REIT on, on notice that there's an opportunity here. And, I, you know, we're very fortunate. You know, we're operating in the strongest industrial market in the country. I think we've got a great company, great team. And, uh, frankly, we're, you know, in terms of what we're, we're going to create here at Rexford, our vision for the future, we're, you know, we, we, we truly feel we're barely out of the starting gate. And so it's, a, it's an exciting opportunity. You know, for the right candidate, and uh, so so far we're we're cautiously optimistic based on a very uh, high high quality of interest uh, that we've received so far. Great, thank you. That's all I had. Ladies and gentlemen, we have reached the end of the question and answer session, and I would like to turn the call back to management for closing remarks. On behalf of the company, we'd like to thank everybody for uh, tuning in uh, today, and we look forward to reconnecting in about three months. This concludes today's conference. You may disconnect your lines at this time. Thank you for your participation.